Okay, thank you for the introduction. Today I'm going to talk about a new pulse sequence denominated Briopsy, which uh, filters out NMR signals coming from thermally polarized spins in FIP experiments. As you know, in certain cases, uh, thermal signals could hide polarized peaks that are or, of, of our interest. In this regard, the OPSI sequence was released years ago as a great alternative to single pulse acquisition. It acts as a double quantum filter, which remove all the contribution from single quantum terms representing thermal signal. It uses a pair of static magnetic uh, gradient fields with an intensity ratio of one, two, an equal duration. What we recently wonder was if we, uh, if, if we cannot use a gradient coil to produce this uh, magnetic field gradient, could we achieve the same effect uh, of the OPSI with uh, inhomogeneous radio frequency fields? Well, uh, what we need to, to do in order to produce this uh, defacing and, ref and refocusing of the selected co coherences as the um, OPSI sequence does is to achieve a radio frequency field varying linearly in a space, usually known as a B1 gradient. Suppose we have an ideal coil with uh, an homogeneous region and a homogeneous region uh, defined with, with, with a constant gradient, where we model with this expression. Here, L represents the position of the coil at, with the, at which the air field vanishes. And suppose we, we have a sample of this length positioned at this region of the coil. We can establish that the spins on the center of the sample will rotate around the RF with this notation frequency. And also, we can calculate, taking into account the principle of reciprocity, the overall mag tra transverse magnetization of the whole sample after a nerve pulse of length tau. So, this uh, simulation here in the solid line shows the um, transverse magnetization of the whole sample after an nerve pulse of left tau for different duration for different size of sample. You can see that compared with the spins in the center, which is here in the, in the dotted line, both curves differ uh, largely, la largely differs be between them, but for smaller samples um, from half the, of, of the first period, both, cur uh, both curves uh, are ex almost ex ex exactly the same. So what we can reach to this first conclusion is that by considering this B1 profile and by manipulating the length or the size of the sample, we can make that the RF behave like a perfect pulse for short times and a gradient as it defaces the magnetization for long times. We're going to test this behavior in a 10 millimeters inner diameter build cage coil inside a seven Tesla magnetic field. A 10 millimeters uh, diameter NMR tube filled up with one millimeter of water was placed inside the coil. This configuration of the sample we will call a sample A. What we did was perform notation experiments for two different RF intensities. These blue dots right here represent the RF intensities extracted from these notation signals. And what we did was start moving the, the tube inside the coil for different distances from the center of the coil. And at each point, we perform a notation experiment for these two RF powers. You can see that when we go farther from the center of the coil, the notation signals start to decay. So we keep monitoring this uh, RF strength profile of our build cage coil until uh, 12 millimeters from the center. We achieve a region that is homogeneous until five millimeters from the center of the coil, which is usually the, the, the space where, the, where our sample is occupied in a standard NMR experiment. And a homogeneous region where the RF intensity uh, decays in approximately li linear track. We perform a linear fit which this slope, which corresponds to an average variation of uh, 40 millitesla per meter at 20 millitesla per meter. You can see that when we double the RF power, we obtain the double of the homogeneities. The next thing that we want to test is that if we put sample uh, in, in the homogeneous region of the coil, if it will suffer signal defacing as, it, uh, as, as, we, as we calculated before. 
So again, we place the water, a six millimeter length sample of water, place it five millimeter below in the center of the coil. This configuration for this in this talk will be uh, will be said as sample B. And we perform notation experiments here. You can see in blue the sample B notation and sample A position at half sample B. You can see in this schematic at this plot. As we calculated before, the both curves, both uh, mag transverse magnetization are exactly the same during the first half period. But when the RF pulse is become longer, the magnetization start to deface. So as a quick recap, until here we want to uh, design this new sequence, with, uh, which, um, as the oxygen sequence does, filters thermal signal in fit polarized spins, with but with the use of inhomogeneous uh, radio frequency fields. So we define this ideal coil with this homogeneous region. And in a homogeneous region where we place a sample and we calculated the signal of the whole sample and compare with the signal of the spins in the set. We test this in, in, in these experiments in, a, in our build cage coil in a seven Tesla um, ma magnetic field where we perform this, um, this RF exchange profile of the coil and we calculated this um, notation experiment. What we saw, what we can confirm from these experiments and from the calculation is that monitoring and controlling the length on the sample in short RF, we can make a 90 degree flip of the magnetization and long RF produce a defacing of the magnetization. This great control of the spin evolution during RF allow us to design the following sequence. Suppose we have this block here in blue where the propagator of this block is defined by this expression. This defines this define a global rotation of this angle around the C direction. But now here, the, the omega depends uh, linearly on this, on this on the space, on this, on, on the, on this variable. So they produce a defacing of the magnetization as a gradient does. So coming from the OPSI sequence, we can see that every time we have every time inter interval that we had a gradient, a, a, a static magnetic field gradient, we can replace it by these three blocks right here. And we can rename this new sequence as Reops. We must be careful with this block right here, which represents twice the linearly varying homogeneities, which in our particular case was applying twice the RF intensities. So we tested our, um, this new sequence in three different thermal samples. We applied two RF blocks with one milliseconds of length. All these, the, all these uh, th thermal samples we, were, was, were put in sample B configurations. We tested in water, which is a non-interacting spin system. You can see the compare with the spectra obtained after a single pulse. The Reopsy actually filters all, uh, almost all the thermal signal. We test in ethanol, which is a weak cap system, again, with really good results. And in one hexen, which is a little bit more complex spin system, but again, we obtain really good, um, a really good filter of the C. Um, before going to test this, uh, this sequence in a para, in a, in a hyperbolized sample, let me introduce you to this uh, combination of sequences that, that we recently published. We add to the OPSI sequence a train of refocusing pulses called PhD FIP, which among other um, advantages enhance the resolution uh, in, in FIP experiments. So it's natural that we want to um, now test or replace this, uh, this block, this OPSI block with the re-OPSI and test how this, uh, this new sequence uh, perform. Before going to the hyperpolarized sample, we need to test the train of reproducing pulses by itself because we will now we will apply thousands of pulses in thousands of inhomogeneous pulses. So we place ethanol in the sample B configuration. We perform two different um, train of reproducing pulses with digital filter center at each of the functional group of the ethanol, the methyl and the methylene. And we obtain this partial J spectra free of artifacts and um, in a really good um, accordance with the, what, what we expected. So finally, we can uh, go to the hyperpolarized sample. 
um, uh, hydrogen in rich in the par state was bubbled in a mixture of one hexene, deuterate acetone, and a rhodium catalyst to create a uh, hyperpolarized uh, one hexene. What was put in the sample B configuration, remember it was in the homogeneous region of our coil, place it here five millimeters below the center. First, we perform a 45 degree pulse, a uh, single pulse to see the uh, the degree of, hyperpolar of hyperpolarization that we obtain in this particular setup. Then we tested the RIOPSI sequence by itself. You can see that we filter out almost all the thermal uh, signal, leaving the hyperpolarized signal un untouched. And finally, we uh, tested this combination of sequences, the RIOPSI and the PhD sequence, the, and the PhD FIP sequence. And this, and this is the partial GS spectrum that we obtain with an enhanced resolution and a really good signal to noise ratio compared to the low uh, degree of hyperpolarization that we obtain in this particular setup. So as a take home message, uh, we introduce a new sequence that uh, filters out thermal NMR signal in FIP experiments with the use of homogeneous radio frequency pulses. Um, the sample only needs to fulfill minimum uh, size and position requirements providing this way a, a simple way to control the evolution of the spins during the RF with no extra hardware needed. And this whole uh, analysis is not limited to the beard cage coil. It can extend it to uh, coils with, um, which produce an RF field with an asymmetric symmetry, and it has an inhomogeneous region that uh, decays in a approximately linear chain. So to finish, let me thank you all the FIB group in Cordova uh, and all people who in different manner participate to this project. And of course, to you for your attention and your invitation to this, um, this talk. And thank you. Thank you so much. Fantastic talk. Um, yeah, I really like the idea of being able to uh, filter out all the thermal signals. It makes sense. Awesome. Um, yeah, it appears we don't have much question. Um, Let's see if we have questions there. Yeah, I, I have a question though. Um, mm -hmm. do you do you have any range of like um some uh, compounds that you think uh, apart from like so saturated um unsaturated compounds like maybe for example exine that you exine that you tested? Are there other like for example like pyruvate that that you could probably in the future maybe able to like um remove thermal uh, animal signals and be able to just identify the, like, the hyperpolarized samples, hyperpolarized signals alone, is it? No, I, I mean, I think I answered your question. We we just tested in, in Hexen, that was the only compound that we had that, uh, that could, uh, that, that, that we could hyperpolarize. So that's why we use that, okay. uh, that, that compound, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm just asking, do you have like in future perhaps, like for example, maybe full market, for example, maybe maybe an ideal candidate, for example, that you, you may want to try. What do you think about that? Maybe. Sorry, could, could you repeat? I mean, like I'm just saying like for future, for example, maybe I'm thinking about maybe full market, for example. Oh uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, we could, we could try. Okay. We could try so we, if we could achieve uh, more uh, hyperlization degree. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah.